So we're here at the SID Display Week, and uh, who are you? I'm Larry Weber, okay? I'm one of the old timers at Plasma, at, uh, at SID. I started in the 60s working on plasma TVs. And in the, 60s. Uh, in the 60s, yeah, and somehow or another, uh, we uh, I survived all these years, and uh, I, I've had a good time with SID. I was a former SID president, and, and uh, I'm just here for the excitement. Did you invent plasma? TV? Well, no, I didn't invent it. I was actually a student of the professors that invented it. So uh, I have a number of inventions. Uh, uh, but my inventions were what made it practical in the later days. I didn't. Uh, when I first saw the thing, it was only a few pixels, about you know that big. And I, I looked at it, and my, my first impression was not very good. I thought this was probably going to be just some professor's pet project that would go nowhere. But uh, I got to meet the professors, and I got to love them, and I wanted to work for them, and uh, with that. I, I kept going and, and uh, I was a survivor and, and, and one of the things we did for Plasma is I, I, one of the inventions I do have is I gave it the very high contrast ratio and even though Plasma is dead uh, today uh, you look around us and you see a lot of uh, very high contrast ratio displays with the deep dark and the reason they have that or one of the, is because they looked at the plasma and they saw the deep dark that it had and they said, well, that's the, the bar is that high. We've got to be at least as good as that. And, uh, and so even though plasma isn't here anymore, uh, really you know, almost the children of, of the, the standards that plasma uh, put up are, are still all, all around us. So where were you doing that? Where, where did you study? Well, I was a professor at the University of Illinois. That's where the plasma display was invented. And uh, I was doing intellectual property development. I had a number of patents, and I had some, some very good patents, uh, but I couldn't sell them because uh, in the United States, the companies that were working on plasma, IBM, Texas Instruments, uh, uh, Control Data, uh, uh, all these companies, AT&T, in 1987, the last major one got out of the business. And so there was nothing to be had in the United States, and there wasn't so much even in, in, uh, in Asia. So uh, I had to start a company, and uh, I went off and uh, uh, started a company that bought the world's largest plant for making plasma displays from IBM in 1987. And then we used that company, and I came here many times to Sid uh, to show my displays. And I remember we, we showed our our 21-inch uh, uh, monochrome displays here for the first time. We showed our that was would have been in like a uh, maybe a 91 or so. We showed our color of 21-inch uh, color in, uh, I think it was 94. And then uh, in 1999, we showed our 60-inch uh, full color. And uh, a lot of people said, oh, that's way too big. Okay, nobody will <laughs> want a high-definition display that says, but, but when people looked at it, they said, wow, this, why does this look so good? And they didn't understand that what was limiting most of the uh, display quality was the eye. And so if you looked at a, a full a high definition signal on a, on a, a whatever it was, let's say a 36 inch CRT, it didn't look very good because uh, the CRT was uh, 10 feet away in the living room and, and your eye couldn't resolve it. But when you had a 60 inch in your living room, it, it really did. So that was a 720p display or 1999 or? It was 1999, it was a, uh, yeah, it was a 720 line. Oh no, 1370, yeah, it was 13, it was, a, Essentially, yeah. yeah. So what's the company name? The one you Plasmaco. 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 Now, you won't find that name anymore because we sold the company to Panasonic in 96. Okay, and then Panasonic took that to uh, uh, develop the world's largest plant for plasma. Panasonic was the, the leading company for, for many years. And, but, of course, uh, Samsung and LG weren't too far behind. Uh, but, uh, again, you know, they're not around anymore, but uh, uh, they're a big part of the display industry. So, um, what's plasma? Plasma is uh, just like a fluorescent lamp. Okay, except we've got millions of little fluorescent lamps. Each subpixel is a single fluorescent lamp that can be red, green, or blue. 
And uh, so it's, it's an old technology in that sense, uh, uh, but it's, uh, it's very good because it's emissive, meaning is it radiates in all directions. Unlike the liquid crystal, which always has to struggle, uh, the, the molecules, the very molecular nature of liquid crystals is they're directional. And uh, that's very good for some things, but it's hard to get a wide viewing angle with something that is inherently directional. Plasma it, doesn't have a backlight. Uh, back, no, the, it's fluorescent lamps. There's no backlight needed, okay? Because each little pixel is like the backlight, okay? It's like, like I say, millions of backlights. It's similar to OLED. OLED also doesn't need a backlight because it's an emissive display. And uh, it radiates pretty much in all directions. Okay, so uh, uh, so OLED is sort of the, you might call it the follow-on to plasma in, in that sense, but uh, plasma is made uh, is quite different. Tiny small pixels. Even in 1999, you had a million of them on a screen, right? Or yeah, more like than that. that. Yeah, yeah. More right. than a million. How yes. do you make sure that all of them are working? How does that work? Oh well, you just have to be very good with your quality. Okay, this is all these technologies have a hard time with getting them all to work. Okay, and yeah. and uh, the ones that nice. did the ones that didn't work, uh, they're back in the lab. Okay, and There's lots of it those? used to be in those. Oh, sure. Well, initially there are. Uh, you know, the first prototype. Uh, if you get uh, more than half of them to, to work, you might actually bring it to a show like uh, SID. Like here we are in the I Zone. And there's some displays you'll see that don't look very good, but because of the way they're done, and, and they're, they're a very significant advance because, you know, most of these things, if you pour enough development money into them, you can get a, a good quality looking display. Yeah, but the first ones never look very impressive, okay? But you don't want one dead pixel. Even one doesn't look good on the screen. Well, you that's right. To be that's perfect. right. Well, but, 100%. you know, that, that's right. And especially at a, at a show like SID here, where just about everybody is very, very critical, okay? One pixel, they say, well, this technology isn't very good. I saw a dead pixel, you know, but it, it, it doesn't, uh, it isn't quite so important to, to judge the whole technology. It just tells you what the maturity of it is and how much more development you'll have to have. With Plasma, could you just push a little bit to the Plasma pixel and make it work again or something? That no, no, no. If there was a dead pixel, it was dead just forever. Just throwing it out. Okay. Well, you wouldn't uh, usually. In the early days, uh, when we were the only technology that could make large screens, you know, long before liquid crystals could make large screens, and large means, let's say, 60 inch, uh, you would ship them with a few bad pixels, and the customers wouldn't mind for the most part, you know, because they wanted to get the latest new technology. They'd pay $10,000 for one of these things. The prices were very high when we had a corner on the market, and, and uh, we needed that because we were still losing money selling them at $10,000 a piece when you weren't selling very many. So uh, it's, uh, it's just uh, the way it, you, you get mature after a while, and now there's no bad pixels generally. So, so. why did LCD win? Oh, well, I, I think there's a lot of reasons, but one reason is, is that the LCD had an advantage over the plasma in terms of the way they could be sold. Uh, plasma started in 1971, we had our first products, which were a 12-inch diagonal, uh, high-resolution um, graphics display with 512 by 512 pixels. So we had a quarter million pixels. LCD was just, the Twisted Pneumatic was just invented the year before, in 1970, okay? So uh, Plasma was way ahead. But uh, what Liquid Crystal could do is they could sell watch displays at a profit. Okay, they could sell calculator displays at a profit. And so they could build up their industry step by step. They went to small TV displays next, and then they went to laptop kind of display, you know, size displays, and then monitor displays. And so every step they could make some profit along the way. Plasma's problem is it came out in 1971, and that was before the laptop, or not before the, the personal computer had come out, okay? So here we had a wonderful graphics display, but people didn't know what to do with graphics, okay? They didn't have software, they didn't have computers, and so uh, we had to sort of, we were stalled there for a while. We couldn't make any profit uh, because uh, there weren't, uh, wasn't enough sales and all that. So uh, we, uh, we struggled, okay? And so one of the reasons Liquid Crystals has done so well is by, let's say, 1988, they had all sorts of infrastructure compared to plasma. So 
all the companies in 1940, I'm sorry, 2014 is when plasma really died. The companies that were making plasma, Panasonic, LG, Samsung, uh, Chong Hong in China, uh, they had much more investment in liquid crystals. So from a business standpoint, plasma didn't make any sense to them because they had 10 times the investment or more in liquid crystals. So from a business standpoint, every plasma they sold was a liquid crystal they didn't sell in terms of large TVs. And so uh, what's the point of having this thing that steals from the, the, the technology where you put most of the investment? So I think that was one of the factors. Okay, but again, there's do, many factors. To do plasma for, smart, uh, for watches or for... Oh, well, no, that doesn't for make sense computer because uh, the, the power requirement of the plasma was just didn't make that sense. And that's why we didn't have watches and we didn't have... Uh, well, you remember back when the liquid crystal watches started out, there was um, uh, LEDs. LEDs came out before the liquid crystal watches came out. But then, uh, you remember, you had to, the, the advertisement was you had to use two hands. Or, you know, you had to use this hand with the watch on it, and you had to have this hand to push on the LED button. So the advertisements for the, the liquid crystal guy says, well, now you can do it with one hand. <laughs> you know? yeah. so, because the liquid crystal took so little power that the, the battery could last for a year or whatever the you know, reasonable thing was. Whereas the liquid crystal battery, you, you only turned it on when you pushed the button because it took so much power. So plasma you know, could have been done, but it would, it would have been as bad as the LED. And uh, so it just didn't make any sense. Okay. There's so. a saying, and I think people are still saying that plasma quality is better than LCD. Well, that's right. What happens is, that is, true? is uh, what happens, the way you tell that is uh, there's a shootout that uh, Value Electronics does every year, and they do it in, in New York City now. And what they'll do is they'll get the best uh, liquid crystals, they'll get the best OLEDs. And then they use the old Samsung plasma that was made, you know, back uh, three years ago. <laughs> and uh, they'll put them all next to each other. And then they let uh, video files, you know, people that are really interested in video, they'll let them go and, and, and vote on them and say, well, and they'll look at all sorts of, they do like a three hour test of looking at all sorts of test patterns and discussing this and that. And and the, the Samsung plasma usually wins, okay. Still not. Even to the even to the, the high quality of the OLEDs. Uh, uh, yeah, there's there's certain things that OLEDs are very good, and liquid crystals are very good too. Uh, they're all it's all it's hard to tell now the difference between these, but uh, there, if you look at all the features, for instance, one of the things plasma is still very good at is the uh, when you have a moving image, the plasma because of its speed. Uh, it does not blur the image. The liquid crystal and even the OLED blur the image uh, when you have an image that moves across the screen quickly. So if you, if you leave it static where it doesn't move, then uh, they, they all look very good. Okay, but if you have it moving, it, it's tough. Okay, and so... Were there any 4K plasmas? No, no. Well, I shouldn't say that. Uh, uh, there were not as products, okay, because we died in 14 before the 4K really happened. But uh, NHK has an 8K plasma. 8K. 8K, which is 150 inches by the side. And, uh, How does so it look like? It looks great. I mean, it's not a, uh, uh, it's, it's a prototype, yeah. okay? So you have to go to Japan to see it, but uh, they developed for the next, uh, and so people say, oh, well, plasma died because it couldn't do 4K. Well, if there, an 8K exists, <laughs> all you gotta do is take the 8K and divide it in four, now you got four 4Ks, and <laughs> you know, so, you're, you're, it, so it can be done, it's just that, for these other business reasons, the plasma didn't advance to that next stage. There's a saying that uh, display technologies don't really die off, they, they might come back. So well, it, I it doubt it because in plasma's case, the amount of investment that you would have to do. It's, if for instance, in, um, in OLED, uh, LG, LG is making these beautiful uh, large screen televisions, which you can see, but Samsung doesn't do that yet. Okay, and now you have to ask what's what's happening there. Well, it's a big investment you have to make in order to do that. So, uh, in order to get that big investment, 
you've got to have certain special business conditions to exist. And I just don't see how plasma is going to uh, overcome that uh, because most of where plasma fits is in that large screen. Uh, you know, if we could make watch displays, if we could ever make the plasma low enough power so it, it was uh, less than the liquid crystal, yeah, then you'd see it in some of those things. But uh, uh, we're, it's not going to be back. But I don't there's think. some companies in the Silicon Valley that have uh, big, famous names. They have so many billions of dollars in the bank. Yeah. They could just put stuff and and realize some of these awesome things we see here at the iZone, right? And just, uh, so isn't it sometimes in the display business uh, just a question of cash? Who's going to put the cash up and then it happens? Well, you need good technology and you need cash and you need luck and you get need good management and you need a whole bunch of things, okay? So these things don't always come together, okay? And, and uh, one of the things I learned in, in running my company is, is, you know, how important keeping the cash flowing in. And, and, and you, in order to do that, you have to have a very, very good story. And generally, the investors are very wary. Uh, in fact, the display industry is one of these things that loses a lot of money, okay? It's very, display business is very, very tough. And we, here, we're, you see the research and development people coming here at SID, and that's sort of the exciting part. But then the guy that has to actually put the money, he looks at all the, the companies that died off, that didn't make money in, in displays, and then you look at how many companies are actually making money in displays today. And so it's, it's not a great picture in terms of, uh, uh, you know, what, what, what the results have been, but uh, in terms of what displays have done for the world, uh, you know, when you have uh, people in uh, countries where they have a hard time feeding themselves, but that they have to have their cell phone with their LCD display on it, you know, because that's, that's almost more important than the, the fundamental, uh, you know, needs of life. Uh, that tells you that we made a, a major impact, uh, you know, in, in what we do here in the display industry. I'd like to say thanks a lot for all okay. the displays. Absolutely. But, uh, how about uh, LCD and OLED? Who's going to win? Oh, I think they'll both coexist for a while, okay? I think uh, LCD has shown some remarkable resilience in terms of uh, giving uh, the OLED some competition, but there are certain places where uh, OLEDs work better than LCDs and other places where LCDs will be, be cheaper and, and, uh, and have almost the same performance. They're adding the so, quantum dot technology and stuff. That's right. That's one of the things that really helped uh, the, uh, the LCD. And they keep uh, adding stuff, but the, but then there's the the OLED. The, then there there might be uh, you know electroluminescent uh, quantum dots. Okay, so those that might be a technology that'll come along and uh, push the you know compete with the OLED a little bit because it'll be emissive and it will be uh, sort of like the OLED in the sense that it's uh, it's a matrix display, but. It can, uh, you know, need a backlight, but on the other hand, it can give them great colors that the liquid crystals now are enjoying with, with the OLED. So all these things are going to continue to be around, and I don't think any one of them is going to necessarily push out the other. They'll and things, all find some place. Things are moving faster and faster in the industry, and there's more and more volume shipped out. People, more and more people are buying more and more displays. Things yeah. are moving very fast. Yeah, that's right? right. Yeah, it's always exciting. Displays has always been an exciting area, and I've seen it now for, you know, I've been a SID member since 1972. So uh, I've been able to watch all this from the start from almost nothing uh, to the point where it is, it's very, you know, it's fun for your, you can tell your wife and your, your kids, you can say, well, look at this, this is what I work on, you know, <laughs> and it's, it's exciting. And how, here at the iZone, are there one or two uh, uh, really exciting booths you've seen Yeah, here? well, you, you heard the people that just won the awards, okay? Yeah, the, the, uh, the, the headlamp uh, yeah. that uh, University of Stuttgart and the other yeah. people uh, I did a from video with Germany them. did is just uh, spectacular. Uh, and uh, it's going to have a big effect, I think, on our safety for automobiles. Another one I like is the uh, the audio uh, that was Let's done there. over there. Yeah, there. Okay, sure. Okay. So, because this eye zone is really cool. It uh, is. <laughs> uh, so where where is that? The the sound. It's right here. So uh, uh, right. Just one. Yeah. Yeah. This one. So. Um, 
Right here? Right here. No, you so, have to, you have to, you know, it's, hey. it's not there, it's here. It's here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, right here. Uh, yes. Ooh, there. Here. <laughs> Whoa. Now no, you're going to hear no, some no. sound. Uh, the display isn't the important thing. The important thing Whoa, when I move on the side. Move, it disappears. What the sound? That's amazing. <laughs> it is amazing. So, so do you think something like this is going to be everywhere? It's going to be what? Everywhere. People are going to have... Well, I think for certain applications. I mean, obviously, if you want to, you know, everybody in the room to hear this, it's not going to work very well. Okay? Because uh, he's standing behind it. He can't hear anything. There's no sound behind it. There's sound here, but over here, there's no sound. How does it work? How does it work? Um, so... We have uh, uh, an ultrasonic-based technology. Um, it puts out uh, audio at an ultrasonic carrier frequency, and on top of that, we inject uh, the, a sideband, and we use the air itself to create the sound right by your ears. That's amazing. So, do you need to have that kind of border on the screen? No, you don't need to have the border. This is a 3D printed frame that we made in our lab. Um, doesn't have to have a thick border. The speaker can be very thin, as thin as 200 microns. And what's the quality? It sounds pretty good. Um, the sound quality is good. Uh, frequencies it covers are about 20 kilohertz down to about 500 hertz. Um, in that frequency range, the quality is very good. And we also have one other thing is we have stereo on this one pane of glass. So stereo. Stereo. So there's an electrically isolated line here. And so that this half is one speaker and this half is another speaker. And this produces a stereo sound. How does this compare with the, what LG is showing with their... So LG's is quite different. They have a very thin OLED. And on the back of that, they've mounted a mechanical actuator that shakes the whole glass screen. You're not shaking doing from that. Behind. Yeah. We have uh, actually a glass with a thin film on top of it. And it's our thin film that's vibrating. Yeah. Not the whole display like, like theirs is. Well, we're here, um, we've got the technology, we've got the IP and the know-how. We're really here at the show to find the right partners to help us develop it further, find the right applications, and potentially license the technology. So, it'll be coming as soon as, uh, as, soon as we can. Hypersound. Could it be on TVs? It could be on TVs. We recommend it for TVs and monitors. We don't recommend it for cell phones or tablets or other portable devices. Is it possible to have uh, several people in the sofa and target one and the other? And can you target So in people? principle, you can, right now, it comes off in a single direction straight. In the center? Straight off the center. In principle, it, the beam can be steered left and right or up and down. That would require... Is it mechanical? It's like... No, no, not me I mean, mechanically, yes, you can do that, but no, you can electrically steer the beam. What that would require is uh, many, many, uh, basically divided into strips, and each strip gets a, its own signal, and then you can control the phase and steer the beam. They call it a phased array. So maybe one person could hear one, one thing, could, the other one could hear another? Even right now, you could do that. Put one, one sound on this side and one sound on this side, and then you could hear two different channels. Yeah, like we've 